I'm Matthew Delaney. I'm here with my good friend Devin Villacampa, and we have Daniel Pearl, the cinematographer. We wanted to start basically with Daniel feeling free to share whatever he wants to about his background and maybe how he started to become a cinematographer. My photographic roots, uh, would you say, would be with a box camera. In fact, <laughs> well, it's over there, but we're not going video, so I don't bother to get it out. <laughs> I, I started out with a box camera when I was about nine years old, and I used to play with my finely detailed military trucks and soldiers and I would set these things up in the dirt and I would jam this um, camera down. It doesn't have any settings of an f-stop or, or a shutter speed or anything. It just it just takes a picture. I put that away when I was 13 years old, lived, growing up in New Jersey in a very hilly town of Upper Saddle River, right on the New York State line up north. It had just resurfaced our streets with new asphalt. Somehow my buddies and I, we learned about skateboards. For $60, I bought an eight millimeter movie camera took that camera and I shot films of my buddies, not telling a story, just cool shots. Me holding the camera on the skateboard, camera taped onto the front of the skateboard. Then every so often my buddies would come over and we'd play the Beach Boys or Jan and Dean records and watch these films. You go forward in time to where 1968, I'm just starting as a freshman at the University of Texas at Austin. The Vietnamese War was raging. And everybody that wanted to raise money to protest the war, whether it be to pay for a permit or get money to print pamphlets you can hand out to get to advertise your demonstration, whatever it was, people needed to raise money. So they would bring in 16 millimeter prints. Videotape does not exist. So if you wanted to see a Fellini, a Bergman, one of the great international films, you had to be in a major city because they didn't show everywhere. The film, like a Kurosawa film, like Seven Samurai, it maybe showed for a week or two in New York. Maybe in Chicago, probably in Los Angeles. And that was it. If you weren't in those cities at that time, you didn't get to see that film. This is an incredible opportunity for me to see Fellini, Bergman, Godard, Truffaut. I mean, you name it. This became my passion. I didn't give a shit about my classes. I mean, I just didn't care about them. All I cared about was these films. At the end of the first year, my grades were, were crap. And, uh, you know, another semester of those kind of grades, and I'd be thrown out of school, which probably meant that I was going straight to Vietnam. You could stay out of the military with a student deferment, but if you fucked up your student deferment, it was like, okay, you've been fucking around. I'm sitting there, and Ted Nicolau, who's still a friend of mine to this day, I go, what am I going to do, man? I got to find something. Flipping through the course book, there were 32,000 students at the University of Texas. Because of the war in Vietnam, it was really swollen. I'm flipping through the course book, and the very last thing I come upon is the Department of Radio, Television, and Film. And I go, Ted, there's a film school here. He goes, what can they teach you in the film school? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm going. I come into film school on day one. Professor Wart walks in and he starts to tell us, uh, if you're thinking this is going to get you in a film business, that's absolutely out of the question. It's a closed industry. It's father to son. Fathers let their sons in. That's it. Nobody else gets in. Now, you have to keep in mind that in this time, there was two independent stations in New York, one in Chicago, and there was PBS. That was it for television. And this independent cinema didn't exist at that time either. Half the class gets up and walks out. Now there's 10 or 11 of us left. I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know where those guys are going. I don't seem to have any options. So I got to stick this out. And the guy says, well, it's not all horrible. He goes, if you're passionate about filmmaking, you know, if you're lucky, you'll go on, you'll work and get a master's degree. Eventually you'll teach cinema and you'll get grants. You'll make films on the weekends or in the summers if you're lucky. So I stick it out. He goes, okay, we're going to make a Western. So we're going to, we got to crew up. So uh, anybody ever work a film camera before? I go, yeah, I have an eight millimeter. Okay, you're the cinematographer. This is a, probably the most fortuitous thing that could have happened to me because you had to do science. You had to understand physics of light. You had to do math for shutter angles and for frame rates and for film sensitivity and the set f-stops. You had to understand a light meter. In those days, you had to have a balance of science, math, and art. And a lot of people are strong in science and math, and they're useless at art. A lot of people are strong in art and can't do anything in science and math. Cinematographers, we have to have a foot in both, especially in those days. My father's a mechanical engineer, and my mother was a painter. I got from each of them exactly the balance that required to function as a cinematographer back in the film days. We went out to shoot the Western. Um, we shot in a field of tall grass. I got the, before Terrence Malick did it, I'm shooting in this big Texas grass and the wind's blowing and he's riding a horse through and the grass is blowing. And of course, Austin, Texas has what I call a checkerboard skies. You know, like Los Angeles is boring. We just have blue skies. The skies either all blue or all gray. Texas, you get like almost like a checkerboard, like 50, 50 white clouds and blue, blue sky and white clouds. Somehow I knew about the color filtration for black and white photography. You alter 
the tones by using color filtration. If you're going to shoot in a forest or a jungle where there's a lot of greens, everything's going to be quite dark. And the skin tones, are, which have a lot of red in them, are going to pop, right? Mm. So if you don't want the, the white skin tone or the, the Caucasian skin tone or whatever skin tone with a red in it to pop more than the greens, you put on a green filter. So the green filter, since it has no red, suppresses the red and allows the green to come through more. So basically, by doing that, you're, you're changing the contrast. Similar huh. thing with red filter, you can make the skies dark. Orange filter, less so. That's how you alter contrast. Well, I played with that on the, in a checkerboard skies. I get the skies real dramatic with an orange filter, I think. And we shot in a forest and on the trail going into the forest, I noticed we were going in there bringing the equipment in. The dust was getting kicked up on the trail. Okay, well, every time we're going to roll, I'd make everybody go out and shuffle their feet. So I get the dust up and then the sunlight streaming through the forest. People went crazy when we showed the film. Oh, okay, shoot my film, shoot my film. So like almost overnight, I became like the staff cinematographer for the film school. It was crazy. Uh, while I was working on my master's degree, there were seven directing students. I shot all their films. And um, there was one guy who was a year ahead of us, and he started hiring me to shoot commercials at the same time. A very important project that I shot was a training film for the Texas Department of Public Safety, the DPS. There were, there were state police in Texas, and it was a <laughs> drug bust. And we shot it in a real handheld, gritty, quick-moving, what would definitely be called cinema verite, but actually cinema combat. You know, running with the cops, coming in there and taking the guy, slamming him against the wall <laughs> that he can't flush the drugs down the toilet. As I graduate, I'm out having a drink with the other seven guys that I went through the master's degree program with. And I say, guys, I think I'm pretty good at this. I think I will shoot a feature film by the time I'm 35. Keep in mind, this is 1973. I'll be the youngest guy ever to shoot a feature f- film that anybody's ever heard of. They all look at me and they go, that's some pretty bullshit. And I go, I know. <laughs> I know it is, guys. But look. I think I'm good at this. I mean, you guys, I, every one of you, you love what I've done for you. I mean, I seem to just keep getting it right. Hmm. Well, three weeks later, my phone rings and it's Toby Hooper. Oh, Dan man, oh, I've seen some of your work and oh, I reckon you're the best cinematographer in the state of Texas, man. Oh, I want you to shoot my movie. I'm 12 years ahead of schedule, man. I've just been asked to shoot a feature film. Well, and, I, and I play it kind of cool with Toby on the phone. Go, yeah, man, I'd like to shoot it. You know, send me over a script. I read it. God, it's so strong on paper. And the hair stand up on the back of my neck. And I'm like going, oh my God, what an opportunity. These guys are crazy. I go, I wouldn't hire a 23-year-old cinematographer, but this is a golden opportunity for me. I need this job. So uh-huh. I ring him back. I go, yeah, Toby, I like it. I like it quite a bit, man. I'd like to shoot it for you. When do we start? Because I'm thinking, if this sits on the vine very long, they're going to come to their senses and they're going to hire one of two guys who later on became friends of mine, both have passed away now, but Laszlo Kovacs and Vilma Zygmunt, right? Who were two of the world's all-time greatest cinematographers. Vilma had just moved on. He'd just been hired to shoot McCabe and Mrs. Miller. So he, he always jokingly said, I wouldn't have taken that movie if they offered it to me. I, I wouldn't shoot anything called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He said, but Laszlo absolutely would have shot that movie. He would have stole that movie from you. Toby had seen this drug bust film and decided that I was the guy who shoot his film. This was the style that he wanted, the handheld, the verite, the sketchy, sketchy lighting. How did I get in the film business? I shot the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and bam, I was in the film business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, me and Matt are uh, both huge fans of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When I was a little kid, actually, Matt showed me this up. It was like a VHS tape of, like, you know, different horror movie uh, boogeymen. And uh-huh. there, was, there was a whole segment about Leatherface in it. And it was the whole scene at the end where uh, Sally's getting chased down the road. Right. And I was like eight years old at the time. Matt was nine. <laughs> so that exposed me uh, at a very young age to the whole uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Don't sue us, man. Don't, don't sue us for what happened to you. <laughs> oh, no. It's all good. I mean, childhood trauma, you know. Right. So you guys, are all, you guys are all buddies, obviously. You guys know each other a long time, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, since uh, preschool, actually, believe it or not. Right. There was like a, a series of different horror movies shown on this videotape, and uh, I just saw the ending sequence when they all run out of the house. She's mm-hmm. screaming, and it was the biggest like, what the f- moment? Like, <laughs> I didn't understand what was going on. I was just thrown in the middle of this like the end of this nightmare. Right. And you, I want us to know more. I didn't see the movie till later, but um, it's a very ballsy, well-made movie, and it's a very artfully made film. It's almost in between uh, 
like it looks very visually realistic, but also very dreamlike in a way. It's hard to explain. I can I can speak to you about that a little bit. I mean, you know, part of it had to do with the fact that I was 23 years old. I thought I knew everything there was to know about life. 48 years later, I can tell you, I don't still don't know everything there is to know about life. That's what's fascinating about you know being a cinematographer. Yeah, you 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 set the shots, you pick the lenses, you you know you you just help design the moves. But really, what separates the men from the boys is the way we light. My lighting there, quite cinema verite looking, the lighting, it's not stylized hardly at all. It's, it's basically, I'm just trying to get exposure. There's a thing called the ISO, ISO or the ASA, used to be known as, that's the sensitivity setting of how sensitive is the film, in this case, to light. Well, because the less sensitive it is, the finer the grain structure, and because we were shooting a 16 millimeter to blow up to 35, it was mandated that I had to shoot on an ISO 25 film. Now, hmm. for those people who are cinematographers out there, they're going to laugh. They're going, what the fuck? The cameras today, Alexis, Venices, they're native in a range of 500 to 800 a- ASA or ISO, right? And you can take them to 1,600 or 3,200. Every time you double that number, you double the amount of light, right? So it's twice as light sensitive. So if you go from... ASA 25, let's see, 20, 50 is 100, 200, 400, 800. There's five stops, right? So that's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. So I required minimally 32 times as much light as is required today to get exposure. At the same time, I didn't have, when I started a movie, nothing bigger than a 2K, a 2,000 watt light. When we went to nights, they got me two 5,000-watt lights and one 10,000-watt light. I'd never seen anything that big before. I thought I was badass. I'll burn fucking Austin down, man. <laughs> a lot has to do with what I didn't know. When you see films now, frequently it's like it bounces, like, you know, Bobby Richardson's famous for bouncing a light off of a table and letting it burst off of a white tablecloth or something like that. It's super efficient ways to use light to make it nice and make it interesting, make it a bit sexy, right? I couldn't do that. I had to drive light. I needed to get exposure. I needed to be able to expose this shit. Now we walk in, we can shoot any. We almost need to light anything. We light today to create mood. As a young cinematographer, first you have to get you have to get enough light to expose because of my lights that were not very big and bad and the film that was not very light sensitive and also my lenses. They were slow lenses. They were not that fast. The film has a very cinema verite look because of that. When I was hired to shoot the remake, the cinema was 106 years old at that time. I'm the first person ever hired to reprise a major position. I was 23 when I shot the original. Remakes are generally 29, 30 years later. So 29 years later, I'm 52. When I was hired to do the remake, I showed up in Texas. I thought for sure it was going to be 2002. You're going to update the film and put a, an African-American in the car, an Asian in the car, and it was going to have the 2002 soundtrack. And they go, no, 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 it's 1973. They turn to me and go, so it's going to be gritty and grainy like the original, right? And I go, you guys, you guys want to shoot 16 millimeter? And they go, fuck, no, are you crazy? We're crazy. <laughs> I said, good, because I don't want to do that either. I said, I've done that. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that film. I'm going to totally flip the look. And this is going to be Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the MTV generation. They look at Marcus Nispel, who's the director, who's, who was, at this point I was shooting everything he was doing. He's a very good friend of mine. They look at him, they go, well, what do you think? And he goes, well, that's what he said. That's what he's doing. And they go, well, what does it mean? I said, your boss, Michael Bay, our boss, Marcus Nispel, and sir, a dozen or two dozen other people have elevated the visual aesthetic of the audience. This is not the same as the audience of 74. 2003, they, they got a whole different visual aesthetic. And so this will be the chainsaw for them. What does that mean? I go, you're just going to have to wait and see. So they turn to Marcus. And he goes, he told you, you're going to have to wait and see. I, I was playing basketball with Andrew Form, one of the uh, producers. And he goes, you know, Daniel, uh, the studio, which is a new line, he says, they call us up every other day saying, you guys must be blowing through the budget. We're on an $8 million budget. And I think about $3 million of that went to Toby. Two and a half or three of that went for the rights. The studio was calling up and going, the film, it looks too good. You must be blown. You're going to be over budget. It looks, it looks like a $20, $25 million picture. Marcus and I, he's, he's, as well as being a great director, he's, he's also a great visualist. And the two of us, just we just make great images together. We did for years in commercials. I'm not even sure why I digressed into the remake. I'm uh, sorry, something led me down that path. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm curious too, because 
you know, you were in a very unique situation where you worked on the original and then you got to work on the remake. Did you feel like a certain obligation to like do the original justice, so to speak, when well, you were working? The, 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 the one thing that I'll say like that is in the original, right? When we went out and shot in the van, we actually did drive. And there maybe a, co- a fifth of the shots, you can see that something is barely recognizable. A, a barbed wire fence post or a tree goes by, but you can barely see it. It's just blown out out there, right? Just white out. So I wanted to fix that problem. You could see what was out there. I was uh, the host of the ASC Instagram page. I posted over under the original in the van sequence and under the the remake in the van sequence. And you get people that love both films. In my opinion, is they're they're two two very different films. Same story. They're made very differently. I think they're both worth watching. It only could be one. Yeah, it should be the original. But... I like the the remake because I think it's a very good looking film. It made the it may be the best looking film I ever made. When Toby took the sequel, I had just finished shooting a remake of Invaders from Mars with Toby, and I tried mm-hmm. to talk Toby out of doing the sequel. He goes, "Why?" I said, "Well, we you we killed the original. To say that you're going to make a film that's received like that was you just be crazy to say I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a film. Of course, you're always aiming for that, but you just there's no guarantee." Many, 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 many thousands of filmmakers go their whole career and don't ever work on anything that gets that kind of recognition. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, Toby, again, you make the same story again and you don't kill it. Everybody just say you were lucky the first time. When I was hired to do the remake, I knew I had to kill it. Now, I knew that mm-hmm. Marcus Nispel and he and I saw and thought about light the same way. We don't even need a shorthand. It's already we're, Our brains mm-hmm. are already wired together. I've been shooting for him, I think, for 13 or 14 years at that time. As far as visual things, we're almost one person. When they were in the process of hiring me, four and four hundred producers, right? Mm-hmm. It was their first film. They were concerned. Well, we're not sure we want to hire you because you worked on the original. And if the film is a success, it could become all about you. And I started laughing. I go, is there a mirror there? Go stand in front of the mirror. Say it again. If the film is a success and stop there. Congratulations. You just hit a whole fucking home run. You're in the film business. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how to erase myself. But if the film is a success, I promise you, nothing else fucking matters. Well, it's, it's so funny that you bring up the remake because, um, you know, I've seen it a few times. Like, I remember when it came out, I, I don't think it was, like, negatively received. I think it was relatively, it got pretty good reception, didn't it? Well, it, well, it, it was the top grossing film that week. Yeah. So that's, that says yes. But one year earlier, they'd remade Psycho and they made it a shot for shot identical to the original Psycho. And everybody hated it. Oh, it's fucking terrible. For ever since we started shooting, ever since we got to Austin, really, Harry Knowles was in Austin and knew that they were casting a film and knew figured out what was going on. They've been bitching about, haven't these guys got a fucking original idea of their own? Can't they just leave the masterpiece fucking alone? Is nothing fucking sacred? You know, he's telling me about this. I go, oh man, that's terrible. I'm sorry to hear it. He goes, yeah, but he goes, but last night, he goes, somebody's posted they've hired the original cinematographer. And he killed it the first time around. Maybe it's going to be different. The whole thing just swings. And all of a sudden, everybody's now in favor of it. And they're all like anxiously waiting to see it. So, well, we want you to do interviews. And I go, you want me to do interviews? I thought it was supposed to not be about me. And go, no, no, no. We're not worried about that anymore. <laughs> in order to keep make both films be valid, to give it a total, totally different visual look, which it is. It's very polished. It's very mm-hmm. stylized. Uh, and, and where the other one is very cinema, very tasteful. like... Here, here's some light, like, you know, not yeah. very contra- you got contrast, you got edge lights, and it's just very sophisticated lighting as opposed to very rudimentary lighting in the, in the original. The one play, now, I also said to myself, I'm the only person that was on the original out of the whole crew, probably mm. 60 people or whatever it was. I said, this is going to be really boring if I'm sitting there, you know, on the original, on the original. I'm not talking about it at all. Like, it didn't, doesn't exist except how it relates to what I'm doing. I was wondering too, since you mentioned like the lighting in the original, there were a few scenes where I was just really impressed by the cinematography and the lighting. One of them is the dinner scene. And also just because I'm really curious about like shooting at night, uh, Franklin's death too in the woods, I think would be interesting to talk about. Okay. Uh, Franklin's death and and a lot of the stuff at night, the chase sequence uh, that ensues right after Franklin's killed, right? Is shot in about a 60 foot, long stretch of a mesquite forest that we lit and and i had a dolly track down the middle of this section that we lit and i could shoot 
I could follow, I could lead, I could profile, I could three quarter front, three quarter back. And so we use all those angles in the same section of forest because if it's just, you're just in a forest, there's just trees. Mm -hmm. There's no point in running around a forest. Just stay where you are and just change the angles on it because the tree is a tree. Also in my Instagram, if you look at it, you'll see a picture of me sitting on a dolly. My eye is done on the eyepiece. So we're going back to one. And I'd seen this picture for years. And about a year ago, I realized, oh my God, that's Gunner is pushing the dolly. The actor who plays Leatherface is pushing a dolly back to one because it's, we're on a little bit of a hill. And he's helping the grip because the grip is having to run as fast as he can. So he's getting exhausted from take, take after take. And so Gunner, the mensch that he is, and Gunner, what, what, a, what a wonderful guy. He wanted the cast to be afraid of him. So he stayed away from them. He didn't socialize with them much at all. There's one picture of him hanging with Bill Vale, probably after he'd already killed Bill Vale. <laughs> probably, because in his mind, he didn't want them to be familiar with him, to be friendly with him. He wanted them to be scared shitless. He was with us more often than not. One time I did have to speak about the original on the remake was on the meat hook scene, which in the original is Terry mm-hmm. McMinn, the female, the second victim, right? Um, and and I, I will talk to you about something that, that's not that's not spoken about very much. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but when they were shooting that with with Mike, um, uh, the it was the male actor that that, uh, that gets hung on the meat hook in in the remake. And, uh-huh. uh, we're getting ready to shoot the scene. I go, okay. I go, okay, let me see it. You know, it show me how it's going to go so I can position the cameras and, and light it. And I got this winch. It's like, eh. it takes about three minutes. I go, guys, this doesn't even take three seconds. This has got to be, wham. This has got to, you know, you, this has got to be slammed out of that hook. Uh-huh. That's how, that's why people feel that. In the original, my ex-wife, we were married at the time, um, Toby wanted her to be the second victim in the original. And she goes, mm-hmm. I don't want to be an actress. She goes, I'm going to do anything in the film business. I'm going to be a makeup artist. She was an anthropology student. She had no zero experience on a film set when we started shooting the film. She did a horror makeup job on herself. Very convincing. I told her, no, no, no. The makeup artist is the one person that has to come from Hollywood. That person has to know blood, has to do all the prosthetic makeup application, all this stuff. She did manage to do a wonderful job on herself and I showed it to him. I had to trick him into watching the footage, but I got him to watch it. I didn't want to tell him what it was. It was mind blown. And she got the job. She was on set. And when it came time, we're trying to figure out how we're going to get her on the hook. How are we going to get Terry McMinn on the hook? She designed, she got like a parachute harness that kept stripping it down and taking it away and taking it away to it wind up just being two pieces that went through, through the crotch, right? It came around and met in the back to a single piece of strapping that went up to an O-ring <laughs> sewed into it. What we did now is in a way it's shot in the original and basically went up doing the same thing in the remake is with the hook in the foreground, Leatherface has picked her up and bring her to the hook and raises her up to slam her. You cut around to the front. The hook's been turned around the other way. So the hook is away from her back. The ring is been, has been already threaded onto the hook and it's up at the top. He, she's held up high and he brings her down with force, bam, like that, right? And she comes down and the hook, the O-ring has no more travel on the, on the hook. And that's what shocks her body, just as if the hook's been planted into her body. So uh-huh. It's actually the spring her down and the sudden stop that just, boom, just, you know. Yeah. I think what's really chilling about that, I mentioned to Matt a few times, like, you know, in another movie, there might be like a, you know, a horrible squelching sound. There's just like silence when it goes in. You almost feel like, embedding into her body people swear to god that you see the hook go into her back the only time you actually see any bloodshed is when gunner falls down at the end after he gets hit in the head by ed gwynn who is the singer for a band in austin texas the conqueror he plays the truck driver and he throws the plumber's wrench at leatherface and hits him in the head and he falls down and the chainsaw goes into his leg right we're in Texas. We're in barbecue country. We had a beef brisket, a piece of sheet metal, a tin wrapped around Rounder's leg, a brisket on top, and then a baggie with some film blood on top of that. So when he falls down, the chainsaw's going. I'm pretty sure we had the hooks off the chain, just the chain. We had several different chains. We had some with hooks that would rip through things, and then we had some that just had a chain on it. 
And I mean, sometimes you ran it to chainsaw with nothing on it because it was moving. You couldn't really tell. So if we weren't cutting anything, if he's running through the forest, we made it safe for people so that nobody, you know, get hurt. But the only time you actually see graphically, even when Ed Neal cuts his hand, that's, well, you sure saw that when he cuts his hand. We rigged a tube behind the knife blade and he goes, you know. So you do see some cutting there, but really it's this thing in the leg, which is really the only time there's real graphic violence to it. The film's, one of its biggest strengths is that your your imagination has to like lean in. You have to lean in to like fill in the gaps of what you don't see. This is, this is not by chance. This is something that Toby and I discussed at great length. We both knew and believed that because we had a limited budget, we knew we couldn't go crazy. We knew that we could take people right up to the point of the murder or the cutting or the mauling or whatever it was. We operated on the principle that each person in the audience would scare the shit out of themselves more than we could do if we showed it graphically. And I actually talked to people about that a little bit. And compare when, when people ask me to sit down and talk to them about the two films, I talk about, well, here you go. We have the original where we had zero visual effects, zero post-production work. Zero, right? Everything that you see is something that we made happen in front of the camera, as opposed to the remake, where now we just go and just willy-nilly cut a guy's leg off while he's running through the sheets. Letting people fill in the blanks themselves is actually scarier. It is. And one thing that's interesting about the original is that there's a score in that movie. I think Wayne Bell and Toby work together. Yes. It's it's the most chilling thing ever. And it, it sounds almost like the psycho violin, this mm-hmm. one effect. It's like an eerie night, uh, nails on the chalkboard sound. Mm-hmm. And it's spine chilling. And, and little things like that suggest dissonance in the environment, like almost mm-hmm. like in your slaughterhouse. But you don't know it. You just like pick up on these things. Little things like that. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, that, 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 is a, that score that they did is, is amazing. The work that they, that they did. You know, It's funny. One of my big regrets is that I wish that we made the film you know, last year or around this time, because a film, a film like that would get a lot more Academy recognition today. I'm an Academy member now, and I happen to be at the Academy, and I looked up on the wall, and there was a picture of us shooting the end scene. And I went, oh, my God, we've made it. I mean, we're now on the wall at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Yeah. did I think I heard you mention once in an interview that um, Toby – it almost as like a protector of the shoe like he was able to convince the producers or the financiers you know not to you know to allow more time for whatever to get certain shots like the, under the, the bench toby and i were basically you know working with the actors to block the scene and then we decide how to shoot it the producers decided we weren't going fast enough and they wanted to make a shot list so we walk in going okay we need these five shots or these six shots whatever it was right after the first week, they decided we weren't going fast enough. We were taking the time to make a good film, but they were worried about running out of money. So they wanted us to, to shut down for a week and come back after Toby would write a shot list. Well, Toby wrote a shot list. They got it over to me. I show up on the first Monday back, and I set up the first shot on the shot list. Toby shows up about a half hour, 45 minutes later, and changes everything. And throughout the whole day, we don't shoot anything on the shot list. Next day, I show up, same thing happens. I set up the first shot on the shot list. Toby shows up, changes it again. Uh, I go, Toby, man, you know, oh, I was going all down, man, didn't I tell you? I said, they made me write that. We're not going to shoot that. I just, I just had to shoot that before he let us go back to work. I, mean, I had to write that before he let us go back to work. We're not doing that. We're going to do it like we've been doing it. That's what's making good images, right? So they weren't really watching what we were doing. But they figured out on the second day that we weren't shooting the shot list. You go, tomorrow, you motherfuckers, you come in, you're going to shoot the goddamn shot list. When I told Toby I wanted to do it, and I told you that I was worried that it was, that they were going to, if it took too long to get going, they'd hire somebody else as cinematographer. So I went to a friend of mine who had some money. I said, listen, I've been asked to shoot a film, and we're shooting a film for $80,000. And I asked Toby, I said, when do we start? Toby goes, oh, damn, man, oh, we're making a film for $80,000, and so we got 70000 from one backer, an oil lobbyist. I go, oil lobbyist? There were a bunch of hippies. I go, that's the pigs. He goes, I know. He goes, but they got money. I went to this guy and I, and I said, listen, you know, uh, read the screenplay. We need, you know, let's put another $10,000. Three hours later, he rings me back. Only $10,000. I want in. I want the whole 80000 going, you, you can't do that. It's like $10,000 is all I need. But because we knew that he wanted to put in the entire budget, anytime that the backer came to us and tried to put his thumb, I told him, hey, would you like your money back? I'll have your money back in an hour. 
They go, no, no, no. <laughs> We're shooting in front of the swing. And we shoot all the shots that are detailed in there. And as Toby's walking away to get into the next one, I go, Toby, Toby, man, listen, we have a platform dolly. It rides about four inches off the ground. The camera that we're using, the Clanner PR, has a big motor that hangs down low. I said, I can hang the motor off the front of the dolly with a wide-angle lens. I can lay down on this platform, and I can fit under the swing, be tilted up, and look it up at Terry's ass in the, in the cutoffs. And the house, I know, just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and envelop the frame, right? The assistant director is also the production manager. He goes, what are you doing? Because I tell the guys, don't walk away. Don't take that track away. So he hears me. He goes, what are you doing? Toby sees us that we're talking. He goes, what's going on? The assistant director goes, he's trying to set up a shot. It's not written on the shot list. You can't do it. Toby goes, listen. He goes, Daniel has just come up with the most incredible way to open the second act of this film. It has all the tension just built up to that point, encapsulated it. He said, get the fuck out of the way. He goes, I'm the director. He's the cinematographer. We're making this shot now. Maybe you're going to fire us. Maybe it's not. Maybe tomorrow somebody else is here doing our jobs. But right now, while I'm in charge, we're shooting that shot. The thing about filmmaking is you need your benefactors. It's great to be an artist, but it's not like you could take a pencil and a piece of paper. I mean, it's expensive to make films. So you can't afford to piss off your patrons. You don't want them to take it over and, and tell you what to do because they're not filmmakers, they're money makers. You know, so it's a, it's a delicate line to walk. Back up on, on one of Devin's questions, if I could, he was asking me about light. Yeah. My favorite lit scene. I, I, I was a smoker at that time, cigarette smoker. One night I was out smoking a cigarette out on the front porch and the van with our dinner came down the dirt road that led to the house. And then that was followed by another car. Well, the first car kicked up all the dust off the road. And then I saw the dust in the headlights of the second car as it came down the road. It was an epiphany to me. I went, oh, my God. This is how I will light the older brother wailing on the hitchhiker, you know, cursing them out as they're going back to the house in front of the pickup truck. I rigged two 1,000-watt lights because the headlights weren't bright enough. Today they are with the sensitivity of film. I told Toby I'm going to shoot it all played around the front side of it. And Ed Neal, who plays the hitchhiker, I told him he's got a bag. I know he's going to be groveling. I know he's going to be trying to get away. Make sure that as you're, as you're screaming around, that you're, you're moving, you're shuffling your feet and moving the bag a lot so it keeps the dust coming up. So it's something that people are still doing every chance they can today. It was way ahead of my time. It just had to be something I saw. You know, I just had my eyes open. I tell young cinematographers all the time, keep your eyes open. Remember them mm -hmm. and bring them to your project. Today, you know, I have a 48-year career as a cinematographer, which is potentially the longest in the world. Dante Spinotti, he's been a cinematographer one year longer than me. He's a lot older than me. As we jokingly say, he doesn't have a jump shot anymore. I still do. Today, the critique that I would have of myself is that I don't get very colorful with the light. I don't think that way. I'm a strange kind of a guy. You know, we both, you and I both talked about being, being lefties earlier before we started this, and I'm left-handed, which gives me, I believe, a different perspective on everything. But I can tell you there are countless times in my career when I've come up with something that to me was clear as day. That everybody else went, how the fuck did you come up with that? You know, shooting a DJ Khaled video last weekend, and I just saw it differently than the director. And, you know, you, you, wow, you know, wow, great ideas. Yeah, sure, sure, we'll do it. The early dyslexia, do you think that informs your perceptions of the world from an early age, emphasizes your visual no. thinking? Well, it definitely does. I mean, so I'm saying that's that the whole different perspective. Also, my parents would drop my brother and I off on Saturdays for a double feature, which is what it was in those days. Your parents would go off and have some time to themselves. Uh, growing up in the metropolitan area of New York, there's a thing called the Million Dollar Movie. They would take one film and show it repeatedly for seven days. So if you were ill and home from school, you either watch soap operas or you can watch the Million Dollar Movie. The Million Dollar Movie was King Kong, Mighty Joe Young, Gunga Din, Invaders from Mars, Godzilla, Dracula, Frankenstein. That stuff has more subconscious influence on me than contemporary films or films that were being made uh, around the same time. It's that early stuff. I really like that old the look of the old black and white lighting. On one level, I wish I'd lived earlier. I wish I'd, I'd been a cinematographer during do your black and white filmmaking. I really do like working in black and white, but that's not... I hear you. Toby expressed a very similar sentiment. I think, I, uh, you know, nowadays I, I like much more contrastly than I did in those days. Look, I didn't know everything there was too, and I had to make sure the images were readable. 
you know, you don't want to go over that cliff of where you can't work out what the image is. You know, you want to keep it sketchy depending upon the mood, of course. But if the mood is that it's dark and mysterious, then you want to be sketchy with the light. And in the digital age, you can hang your toes right over the edge of that cliff. So now, you know, we can see it. So you can just really get sketchy with light. You can really have the whole audience like actually leaning forward to, which is great too, if you're gonna, especially if you're going to give them a scare. If you get them where they're like intently trying to work it out and bam, you hit them with a scare, they'll take them right out of their seats. We were making films from our head and our heart and we were pioneering stuff. We were coming up with stuff. Now I feel like a lot of directors, young directors in particular, they study films and then they want to take from this film and that film and that film and that film. And I'm not saying you can't do that, but some do it with good intentions and it's called for and it's fitting. And some just want to just throw these techniques in there. There's only, <laughs> there's only so much of, and I want to do this like this film and this like that film. Recently, I was doing something and the director, oh, this is like such and such and such and such a film. I go, you know what, man? I don't even watch films. My shit comes from my head and my heart, not my ass. I'm not a Xerox machine. I don't copy other people's <laughs> shit. You know, it's just these are ideas that come to me. If somebody else has thought yeah. of them as well, that's fine. But I promise you, I don't see somebody else's film using the technique. I see our film using the technique. You were saying back in the beginning, it's almost a movie that you wish you could have made nowadays. Yeah. And I kind of agree with you on that because I think you might have actually received more credit for Absolutely. it now. Yeah, because, you know, back then, like, there were all these Grindhouse movies coming out, and people were just like, oh, you know, that's just another, like, Splatterhouse movie. But nowadays, like, I think people reflect on how artistic the movie was, and, you know, that might have been recognized more. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not getting too political on you. In the old days, <laughs> only the left could like the film. Now the left and the right can enjoy the film. <laughs> it's funny, because this is an exodus. People are leaving Los Angeles, right? I'm not. My wife and I are. I love the weather here. I mean, the taxes may be high, whatever, it may be expensive place. But at this point in my life, I can afford to live where I have the best life. But the guys that are, some of them are leaving and going to Texas, right? And I'm going, you're going to fucking Texas? They go, yeah, man, I'm going to Texas. There's no state income tax, 0% state income tax. I go, yeah, but 100% Texans. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I go, well, you know, Texans are cool. I go, do you guys think that we totally made up the Texas Chainsaw Bowl? Do you think we just totally made that up? Austin, super safe spot. Houston, less so. Dallas, less so. San Antonio, less so. But still, there were cities you could go visit your family or go with friends to see their family, and you could be okay. But in a little towns, if your car's your car broke down in between, you were fucked if the rednecks got their hands on you. I mean, I oh, yeah. believe that. That's what Texas Chainsaw Massacre is, is about, is that fear. It's a, it's a political Absolutely, allegory yeah. up and down the line basis is drawn on the fear that we were sure that if the rednecks ever got their hands on us that they would totally have their way with us that's where they came up with the whole idea of who's the bad guy in this film mm -hmm. the genius was of course putting a chainsaw on it we shot him under the title leatherface warren scarron who went on to become the head of the texas film commission they came up with the idea to call out the texas chainsaw massacre we had two weeks left to shoot or less. When Toby told us, we all thought it was a terrible title. We were, we were wrong. I mean, it's, it's a great title. Texas already just brings horror. My father absolutely thought that there was an energy that people, that Texans had, and he wanted his sons to experience that energy. The raw heat of that environment, that's like body acting and body language. You can't fake. You can't act that. That's just something you pick up on, that body discomfort. At the time we were making a film, we thought the horror film was our experience. The dinner scene is 27 hours straight because John Dugan, who plays grandpa, he was 18 years old at the time. He plays a 108-year-old man. He had prosthetic pieces to put on. Plastic surgeon helped make the death mask to make him look like 108 years old. And then he and my ex-wife, uh, Dottie Pearl, they applied the stuff on him. It took nine hours and a stifling, even though they were in a motor home with air conditioning is still, it's over a hundred degrees. Air conditioning in 73 was not good enough to deal with a hundred degrees, right? He didn't agree with this story, but this is a story I'm sticking with. I'm the guy who did the 27 hour shooting. So at the end of the nine hours, it's announced that he's coming out, he's ready, and he's never doing the makeup again. We have to shoot him out. We shot for 27 hours straight. It was over, well over a hundred degrees outside. We're shooting in the daytime, so I've got black tar paper over the windows, which is only making it hotter inside there. There's no airflow whatsoever. Bob Burns, brilliant production designer. Yeah, there's Toby, Kim, who wrote it with Toby. Toby's a director. Of course, the performances 
I get a lot of props for 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 my work on the film. But the two people that are no longer with us is uh, the makeup artist, Dottie Pearl, and Bob Byrne. It all starts with Bob Byrne's props and sets and stuff for us. That gives this gives the film this creepy edge. A lot of the time, it's just simply capturing what what he just laid out there for me. I was able to contact a fan page on Facebook, Toby Hooper fan page, and I kind of you know gave them the opportunity to ask questions. What did you take with you from Toby Hooper that you kind of still carried into something that you learned that you carried into your own filmmaking? One of the things that Toby and I believed together and only got reinforced through our work together was this theory that we don't have to show the violence graphically, that we just take people up to the point of the horror and then cut around it. Like, for example, uh, one of you had asked about the killing of Franklin. Now, the killing of Franklin, first of all, because of my light being not very sensitive, the flashlight is a 650-watt light bulb. You have to be careful. It would burn you. I mean, it's so hot. I didn't even have the 5K and the 10K yet at that point when we shot that. So I, I rigged up this thing with a very bright light bulb. And we wore a belt that was like a military belt full of D-cell batteries, a 32-volt battery belt we had to make to drive this, this light called a sun gun. Toby and I also, and this is something that I brought to him because I'd seen it in a Fearless Vampire Killers. It was widescreen, anamorphic film. We were only 185. We were 235 to 1. We were 185 to 1. What I noticed in that film was that they would lead your eye to one side of the frame. The scare would come into the frame. So by the time you detected the motion and your eye went back, it was in the frame when you saw it. We try to play with that as a a form of of misdirection. The same thing magicians use, misdirection. In this case, Leatherface doesn't make an entrance in the frame. When the light comes up, he's there. Things that break a frame line and come in are still like my hand coming in to grab my throat. It's still kind of scary. But not if when you look up, there was no hand there. And there's you look away, look back, and the hand's on the throat. It's like, what the fuck? So I actually just used that on, on my last feature, which is The Intruder. Dennis uh, Quaid, who plays the bad guy in the film, he's there. He's in the frame. He was not in a shot. Camera goes off, comes back, and bam, he's there. Like, how the fuck did he get into the frame? There's a theme that I discussed with Devin once about uh, how the movie has one foot firmly in reality mm-hmm. or a cinema verite and then has one foot in like a slightly hyper stylized reality. Toby even mentioned like the editing. He removed two or three frames to make it appear in addition to what you said that all of a sudden he's there and it's like there's no preparation. There's no revving the chainsaw. He's just like yeah, bam, he's he's there, there to, you know. Yeah, bam, he's there. It's like people like to jump out of their chairs. They, they, pay, they pay money for that. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to ask you about um, Invaders from Mars, because I feel like that's kind of like... almost. he's like got, follow- got a following, which is crazy. Because I must have seen the original when I was a kid at least 20, 30 times. When we shot that film, it's the first time that computerized lights, Verilites, which were basically invented for rock and roll shows, were ever used in a film. They were rather time-consuming to, to program there's an opening shot where it starts from the sky and it kind of descends in like a spiraling motion and kind of tightens on the father and his son as they're like looking at shooting stars. I thought that was a, a unique shot. Well, what, what happened was also what was new at that time was a thing called a Luma crane at first of the remote cranes. We were trying to exploit that. So there's that shot coming down. It was a conspire lens. Uh, it's because they will look straight down and come in. Uh, also, there's a shot that goes, uh, starts to go over the fence and, reprise the through the swing is there anything you can briefly just reflect on about your impression of toby during the making of that film or how your relationship maybe changed toby toby had a rough time making that film it was it was it was a hard time for toby um i'm not sure what was going on uh for him it's funny we had i hadn't shot for him after texas chainsaw massacre until 83 uh when a very good friend of mine uh, who wrote a lot of the early music videos. He wrote all the Duran Duran videos and Billy Joel and a lot of these things that really put music video on the map. It was the English industry. His name is uh, Keith Williams. And he basically wrote for all the English directors. He came to the house one day. We lived about four blocks apart in what was called at the time Music Video Hill. It's Hollywood Hills behind the Hollywood Bowl. This producer, he came, the producer had an idea to get rich quick by making a Billy Idol video with 3D with anaglyphic, which is blue, green, and red. So red, one lens, and blue, green, and the other lens. And then you may have seen comic books like that, the anaglyphic. Mm-hmm. 
but he wanted us to make a 3D video that way. And his plan was to sell the 3D glasses in 7-Eleven. Of course, MTV was the rage at that time. That was the biggest thing going on. So he was sure that he could make a million dollars. And in 1983, he thought that was enough that he could make a million dollars, he could retire and be done, get in and get out one time. He thought Billy Idol was the right edgy artist to, to get that going with. He goes, oh, Billy Idol, I'm a producer and I'd like to make your next video. Oh, yeah, you, you won't produce my next video. Get me a guy that directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre as a way of getting rid of it. Just, you know, go away. Which, oddly enough, is also how I got pulled into the music video. The producer's talking to the writer and going, fuck, how the hell am I? You know, Toby Hooper, he's a recluse. He doesn't talk to anybody. You know, nobody can reach the guy. How the fuck? You know, I got this great idea. And, and Billy Idol let me make the film. I just need to get Toby Hooper to agree to do it. And Keith goes, well, look, Daniel Pearl is a good friend of mine. He just lives a couple of blocks away. We'll go up to his house and we'll see if he can get through to Toby. Now, Toby had just been through a rather trying experience on Poltergeist. Poltergeist is being produced by Steven Spielberg. When you have somebody of the caliber of Steven Spielberg that's got a finger on your project, it's hard to move in a way at a pace. This guy's the master. He's the greatest of all times, right? to move in a way that's going to make him impressed or make him feel like you know, it's going well or the film's going to play well or something like that. So he started to to tamper with what Toby was doing. I wasn't on, a, on that job, so I don't know, but I do know people that were on it and, and, and it was it was a tough situation for Toby. This is what's going to happen when you roll with people that are the tops in their business. That's what they do. Remiano was set in some peripheral way, but before you know it, I, I just because we're just what we do, we just get involved. You just can't help it. It kind of like diminishes the work that Toby does on that because no matter what he did to like, you know, elevate that picture it becomes obscured by the, you know, the knowledge that, like you said, Spielberg was the big wig. I don't know the character Zelda. I don't know if that is Toby because she's certainly weird enough that that could be Toby or if mm-hmm. it's Spielberg having her play Toby. Definitely is Toby. That character is, is Hooper-esque in every way possible. Totally. Toby's hiding out. He's not seeing anybody. I go over to his place. I'm knocking on the door, knocking on the door. I go, Toby, Toby, it's Daniel, man. Come on, let me in, let me in. So finally I convince him to let me in. He goes, what's going on? Go, Toby, they want you to direct an MTV video. He goes, I've been watching that shit. He goes, I've been holding up in here for a couple months. I've been watching it. He goes, that's the coolest shit going on. He goes, Ooh. I go, Billy Idol. He goes, Billy Idol. He goes, that's the best guy on there. As we're doing it, there was a technology that we used to use. Now you just do it on a computer. It's much easier. But we used to, to save money, shoot things that are called glass shots. And you use a very wide-angle lens, a very deep focus from near to far. And, like, for example, I used it in Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. In Billie Jean, when you see the wide shot of him walking in the sidewalk, lighting up as Michael Jackson's walking on the sidewalk, only the sidewalk and the storefronts exist. The second story of the stores and the city in the background, that's all painted on glass in the foreground. We would set that up at the beginning of the day, a big piece of glass with one camera and a wide angle lens. And this guy, Eric Critchley, who was one of the mm-hmm. most inspiring people I ever worked with, he could see and then he would paint the rest of it, that blend that matched up with the storefronts to the second story of the building and the city behind and then extending the road out. He could paint all that stuff. And you'd get one or two what we call big production shots where you could only build a set such a size and you wanted something bigger. So Toby wanted that because he goes, I need that for the rooftop because we're only going to build a rooftop and I got to put the rooftop on a building. So I need a a glass painting that's going to let us get back on the rooftop and put it in a building. And then also he goes, I want to view down the side of the building as the people are climbing, climbing up and they're only going to build me like, you know, 12 feet. And I need the rest of the building down to the street. It's got to be, you know, 30, 40 stories down there. Mm-hmm. I go, oh, Toby, no, 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 man, you can't do that. And he goes, why? And I go, because it's 3D. He goes, well, what do you mean? I go, well, this is an illusion again. It's a trick, you know I mean? What appears to be the background has been painted in the foreground. Mm-hmm. And in a 3D camera will give that away. What appears to be... The, the buildings behind Michael Jackson and the cityscape behind him is actually in front of him. And 3D will show that it's wrong. I said, you can't do it. You go, well, fuck it, then we're not doing 3D. So <laughs> well, he throws the 3D out the window. So the genius idea to get rich quick on one video never happens for this guy. <laughs> but what does come out of it is Toby is nominated for Best Director on the very first MTV Awards ever. 
Fortune magazine at this point does an article, there's a full page picture of me in it, that this is to save the music business. The music business is going down the tubes and the music video rejuvenated it. And so this is the hottest thing everywhere you go in 1983. It's the hot medium of the time. And all of a sudden, yeah. who's just been beat up and bruised by, by Spielberg has now risen up as one of the fucking hottest guys in the new hot medium. So he's back on his feet. He's up. He's standing tall. He's standing straight. And that, to me, is one is probably the payback because I'm forever indebted to Toby that he gave me an opportunity as a 23 year old cinematographer that shaped my life. Mm-hmm. I actually have a question, really quick. So there's that whole scene when Jerry walks into the house and he opens up the freezer and Pam is in there. Just this weird thing where she kind of like jolts for a second, like she's alive, and then you know Leatherface comes in, kills Jerry. And he kind of stuffs Pam's body back in like she's already <laughs> dead and she doesn't really react. So I'm curious, like, like, was she alive? Like, what exactly was going on there? Well, I question that as well. I go, well, isn't she dead already? I mean, she's been in the freezer. How do you come back to life? He goes, don't worry about that, man. It's, it's going to him, He and Kim both. <laughs> You're overthinking it. Don't worry about it. Just just trust us. This would be cool. She got very bruised from all of her handling by, by him. I mean, you know, Marilyn Burns also had to wear knee pads and, and stuff underneath her wardrobe, getting thrown around. Pretty brutal. At the same time, we absolutely thought we were shooting a comedy. We thought it was funny. I mean, we were laughing, you know. In some ways, it kind of is funny, I guess. Yeah, like, I mean, it's meant to be. It's a political allegory. It's about the whole thing about the fuck up of the Vietnamese war and the whole dodgy politics that are going on at that time. It was banned in England for a long time. We go, what are you banning it for? It's a comedy. Don't you guys get it? And the remake, it went on for a long time, like for three months before they actually hired me on a job. I told you a little bit about their word about it being all about me and all. At one point I said, you guys need somebody who can do beauty and horror. Because at that time, I'm doing music videos with Mariah Carey. I'm doing music videos with Whitney Houston. I'm doing music videos with the Divas. We were talking about the heat in Texas. And I'm now believing that 29 years later, because of global warming, it was worse. Marcus Nispel, who at the time was one of the top commercial directors... And Michael Bay formed a new company called Platinum Dunes. And the idea, still functioning to this day, was to remake classic horror films. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the first one. It took quite a lot of convincing for them to allow me to be Marcus's cinematographer. I had been shooting for Michael Bay earlier in his career. Uh, He had yelled fuck in front of my daughter when she was eight years old. And my wife, who handled my bookings, took exception to that hired me onto a job and then sent me to Rome on, on another job and then didn't tell Michael Bay till the day before that, oh yeah, by the way, Daniel's not even in the United States. He can't shoot your job. You better find yourself somebody. There was that bit of bad blood there. Marcus kept insisting for multiple reasons. One, I was a guy that was working with him. He knew that he and I saw light in the same way. He knew that I was the one guy who would not copy myself. He knew that I would shoot an original Texas Chainsaw Massacre for him it was more than a job to me. It was like a reinforcement of my career. There's this thing that a first-time feature director, producers almost never want that director to have their choice of cinematographer because they're worried about a new director. So they want a cinemato- cinematographer who's their boy in case they get at odds with the director. It's fucked, but that's what the producers are trying to do. A cinematographer, especially when it was film, controls the machine that captures the images. Now that is digital, you can say, oh, yeah, get the fuck out of here. We can see fine. All right, shoot. But when it was film, only we knew how to expose the film. You know, there's a lot of things could go wrong when it was film. And you didn't know until the film came back from the lab. That's like three, four, five days. So you have to have people you can trust. They call me up. They go, okay, we're thinking maybe we'll hire you, but you got to send us a reel. I go, send you a fucking reel? Are you guys for real? Send a reel? So I take a Divinals video that Michael Bay directed that I shot for him called I, I Touch Myself. Then I put um, a Michael Bay, a meatloaf, I do anything for love, but I won't do that. That was followed up by Marcus Nispel's Fuji's Ready or Not. And then I gave him a copy of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Marcus Nispel rings me up the next day. He's laughing. He can hardly stop laughing to talk. He goes, I know you're telling him just go, go fuck yourselves, guys, with this. He goes, but you have no idea how well it worked. Michael Bay takes me in 2002 to his office. He's got a massive, I guess, probably like a 72-inch screen in his office at that point. Up comes the Divinals video. He goes, Marcus, he goes, this is my first ever nomination I got for Best Directing. I got, I got nominated MTV Best Director for this. Then comes the Meatloaf video. I do anything for love, but I won't do that. 
Oh, Marcus, he goes, you know, when Bruckheimer saw this video, he called me up and said, look, man, you should be directing features. Then comes the Fuji's video. And he goes, oh, fuck, Marcus. He goes, when I saw this video, I decided you should be directing features. At which point Marcus goes, there seems to be a pattern here. Why are we fucking with that? And they go, okay, you're right. So now, because it's Marcus's first movie, everybody's telling him what to do. I don't know how many directors you guys have talked to. People don't become directors because they want to be told what to do. They become directors because they want to tell the whole fucking world what to do. He's going, they're driving me fucking crazy. Everybody's telling me what to do. Daniel, there's 11 pages. Now, in a feature film, somewhere around three, three and a third, three and a half pages a day is what you're expected to shoot. Because this art form also is a business. He goes, yeah, so we're, there's 11 pages in the van. We're going to shoot the whole 11 pages on the first day. That's a lot. He goes, I don't give a fuck. Because we shoot the 11 pages on the first day. Everybody's going to have to shut up and leave me alone. We start on a Monday. So on Friday... He goes, on Friday, I want to go out and just grab some shots. I go, oh, Mark. I had grabbed some shots for him. The black and white sequence that opens the film. A lot of the footage and that stuff. Finding the glasses in the stream. They wanted me to test the black and white. I said, I want to make the black and white 16 millimeter. I do want that to be grainy. So I want to actually over-process it because I want to make it look like it's from 73, the footage. Anyhow, so I go, Marcus, no, we're not going to go out and do any more. I already did some of that. He goes, I know. I didn't even know you shot that. He goes, when they showed it to me, he goes, it's like finding money in a winter coat. If you want to shoot 11 pages in one day, we have to put the van up on a process trailer. When you shoot a lot of car stuff, the lights are in the actor's eyes. You don't have them drive because it's dangerous. They have to act. So you put them on a low boy trailer so the car's only more 10 or 12 inches more than it would be off the ground. So it doesn't look like you're flying. Mm-hmm. And tow it with another vehicle and the actors can act. I said, we've got to put the van up on a process trailer. We'll put a dolly track. It's in a U-shape that goes around the van. Actually, a J-shape, but there's more down the passenger side. I'll pre-light the whole thing, and we'll rehearse it with the actors, and we'll go through all 11 pages on a rehearsal day, and then we'll go out on a Monday, and we'll shoot it. He goes, great. We do this at the former Bergstrom Air Force Base, which is out on the tarmac. It's July. It's over 100 degrees. It's hot as shit. And Marcus wants to cast... He goes, they've been in a van for five days. I want them to be dirty, and I want their hair to be stringy and greasy. They haven't bathed in five days. And the producers are going, no, no, no. And he's going, no, that's what I want. And people can't question what directors want, right? You can only fire them at some point, right? You can try to talk to them, but they, you say it to them once, twice, and they still still want it. Then you either got to let them have it or fire them. So they, they come to me and they go, we can't have this dirty, stringy hair, dirty cast. Like this Jessica Biel. For fuck's sake, you know. They go, listen, they say to me, they convinced us that in order for this film to work, the guys in the audience want have to want to fuck the girls that are on the screen, and the girls in the audience have to want to fuck the guys that are on the screen, or else the film doesn't work. So I'm going, okay. And they use that term exactly. I mean, that's exactly the way they put it to me, right? Now we're, we start to rehearse, and they go, okay, Marcus, make them look dirty. I don't like, you know, put the, and now they're sweating profusely, and it's, it's just coming off of them. It's just... Marcus, I go, this, this dirt thing, it's just not working. They're sweating so much. He goes, well, I don't want it to look like a fucking pussy yogurt commercial. I said, well, how about if you're sweaty? I said, because that's going to happen anyhow, knowing very well that if I've got them spritzed up and they're wet, it's going to make my light sparkle, right? He goes, brilliant. Okay, no more dirt, no more stringy hair for now, and the hair's clean. And we spritz them every take, we spritz them. And even though we're shooting sometimes for two minutes, three minutes at a time, they start sweating the producers next thing i know he's on one side of the van when he agrees to do to do this right and i'm on the other side of the van we're talking through the van the two line producers on their hands and knees come crawling around the van and they get down (laughs) bowing to me and like for saving their asses because if they'd been dirty it would have been everybody would have been sacked (laughs) what would you say is something that you're really proud of in the remake the overall look of the film. And I, I love the rain sequence at night, that big, that big, we had an 80 foot, you know, it was raining the, the truck, you know. I mean, I, I just love everything about it. I, the, the whole thing was a joy for me. Making the original was like, you know, halfway up my lip in the water. I go, well, I'm going to get drowned any minute. Right. I'm a kid, I have good ideas. But at the same time, it was tough. It was difficult. I didn't know that much. It was, you know, it was hard. We were a bunch of young filmmakers. More than half the crew came over from with me as, 
Ted Nicolau, who I told you about, I was in his apartment when I decided to go to film school. I got him hired as a sound recordist. He did the sound mixing, right? Wayne Bell, who did the track, did the track was his boom operator. Uh, the editor, Larry Carroll, was the was the director who gave me the first jobs that I had and shot that the Texas drug bus film. He was the director of that. I got him on as the editor. My wife, who I was married to at the time, uh, she came on as the makeup artist. Uh, Ted's wife uh, was our caterer. And the crew, the, the, the camera assistants uh, and grips and electricians were, I was a teaching assistant while I was getting my master's degree. Then the hands-on technical crew were guys that were my students. Uh, I didn't so realize how tightly networked they were. It was very tightly networked. You know, and, and uh, there's a lot of people that when they hired me, it, it filled like probably about half the crew. Not the, I didn't, I didn't bring anybody into the art department, but, but, you know, sound, lighting, gripping, it's just the camera moves, makeup, makeup and catering. I mean, that's the one, the one thing you can do when you're feeling, you can't, you can't rest. You can't sleep enough. You don't get enough sleep. We couldn't avoid the heat. So the only pleasure that's left is to eat. How much stress on a production shoot makes the art just a little bit better, like especially with the case yeah, of Texas shoes? Absolutely, it does. I, I think every one of us that you could speak to would tell you it was a motherfucking tough situation, but probably contributed to the effect effectiveness of the film. Definitely, some even described it as worse than Vietnam. We were, we were fucking yeah. I mean, well, I don't. Yeah, I, I never went. But, I never wanted to be shot, which is completely stupid because I have a daughter who's a pilot in the Air Force, has been to Afghanistan four times, and flies Hercules C 130 airplanes and delivers the Navy SEALs, parachute troopers. I have a daughter who went the other way with it. It's, it's interesting. They wanted to fly drones. She goes, I'm not, I'm not being in Las Vegas killing people in Pakistan. I'm not doing that for you. If you want me to kill people, I you have to have a chance to kill me, which I go, uh, right. Are you sure? No, I'd like the other deal better myself. But. <laughs> well, I mean, you kind of made, you, you said a lot about war in Vietnam in particular with that movie without saying anything explicit about it. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's definitely what was going on. Uh, you were talking about being eight years old, uh, or no, Devin was eight years old when he first saw the film. Ted Nicolau, his, uh, his daughter, Corina, and his wife, who was our caterer, uh, Sally, she came to bring us a meal one time. It's mm-hmm. while we were shooting that sequence where you start the chainsaw the fir- for the first time, the chainsaw's in the movie. And you start to carve up the body, which you don't see. You just see him start mm-hmm. the chainsaw and you hear the sound and the smoke is slowly building in the room. Video assist does not exist at this time. So there's no way to see any of the imagery except for looking through the viewfinder, which only the cinematographer can do. You're either looking through the viewfinder or you're waiting until the film comes back in the lab to see it. There's no other way to see it. And what I loved about that situation was that the way you would work, you have a camera and the eyepiece comes off and you're behind the camera, the eyepiece comes off the left side. You put your right eye in there. Focus puller is right in front of you, pulling focus to make sure that as the actors move or the camera moves, that the shots stay in focus. And then on the opposite yeah. side is the director with his head as close to the lens as it can be. So he's seeing the visual relationship of the elements. It was great because directors are right there. Today, because we send an image out to a big monitor, and then there's a, a video village or a tent built around that. So now the director's off someplace, sometimes in another room, sometimes he's just in a, in a black cube, you know, a tent, but you can't hear him because it's muffled, he's far away. And communication is, there was fantastic communication. We were all at each other's elbows. We were all right there. And now it's more dispersed. There's some great things about the digital process in terms of the camera and that you can see it right away and what we can do and the sensitivity. and the, But the downside mm-hmm. is, is that we're more spread out now. We're less focused than we used to be. It used to be a dollar a second to turn a film camera on. Everybody was fucking focused, so it's a dollar a second. That's $60 a minute. Yeah. As cameras first went digital, I refused to shoot anything digitally for three years. And once I wasn't working at all, it's funny, the director I just came back from working with on DJ Khaled, uh, Gil Green, he hired me to do a Rick Ross video called Aston Martin Love. It's the first time I ever shot anything digitally. Uh, everybody went crazy. People wrote all about it, and, and it didn't matter. I'd never done it. I'd only done it once before. Suddenly, people were shoot my shoot my project, shoot my stuff. So I was back at it right away again. I still still to this day try to approach it as much like a film shoot as I can. 
procedure's different. There's an image up. There used to be no image that anybody could look at until we gave an F-stop, which is when we were ready to shoot. Yeah. It was approximate. It was like, it just was something there. So you could say, oh yeah, there's, are all the chairs at the table? Yeah. Or, or you know, is the picture on the wall? You could look at the monitor and see. You couldn't tell the quality really of the image. Now you have a pretty fucking good idea of what the final image is. I mean, yes, there's still color grading and you can change it, but by and large, what you're seeing on a monitor, because you can set a, a, a look ahead of time to the monitor, should be what the end product, what you think it is at the time. We, as yeah. a cinematographer, you are right there at the juncture of what it looks like and how long it takes. You're in charge of the people who do the work for you. you don't, you're not actually not allowed to touch anything yourself on a union set. But the people have to move at a pace or else you don't get to do what you want, which means the look is going to be less than you wanted. And also, right. you're going to try and get it, so probably you're going to take too long. In the old days, I felt like it was more of like a coming together and a crescendo to roll. Okay, everybody, here we go. We're going to, okay, we're going to roll. Well, right. now it's like, oh, put the actors out there, you know, welcome around. Okay, you know, I kind of like it. Let's roll. It's like, well, wait, wait, wait. What about, you know, we would look at the actors and then send them away and get ready and then shoot. No, no, it looks good the way we said. Let's just roll. The set dresser, yeah, yeah, it looks good. The picture's on the wall, and they go away. So they may not be around. When you want to talk to them about a problem, they go, I saw it on a monitor. It was fine. I went away. Yeah, but then it changed, or we moved the camera. You know, if you want to talk about my feelings about the process today, well, there's a lot of great advantages. The cameras are more light sensitive. The cameras are lighter. The lenses are, sh are sharper, crisper. We actually use old lenses now because the lenses are too sharp. We go out and buy, you know, vintage lenses to break the back of the film. Because the people that work in technical are engineers. And so they just know that sharper is better. No, because too sharp is like, we don't want to see every pore in the skin. They keep trying to make reality. Yeah. That's not what we're about with film. Film captured things with a different, softer, kinder edge than you see in reality. There are 300 steps of contrast that the human eye can see. Film can only distinguish eight. Right. So had the light to bring these things into play. And we use that. Like, well, you still can do it now digitally, but you, you, we have to actually go out of our way. When you see somebody in silhouette against the sunset or something like that, you see it in silhouette. Well, that's mm -hmm. something that was easy to do in film because unless we put light in, you just expose for the, the sunset, the person was in silhouette. Yeah. Now, digitally, we actually got to bring blacks in a whole light off the person in the foreground because they're getting close to seeing what the eye sees. We had to light everything in the film days. Day exterior, yeah, you go out there without lights. But right. even then, the shadows would be too dark, so you had to put, put light into the shadow, or else the person would be lit and the shadow would be black. My career was lighting stylized, giving it some snap to it and making it look something that was more than what reality was. I was trying to make something that looked better than reality. Not but, National yeah. Geographic. Exactly. I call that National Geographic. National Geographic takes a, a really good picture of whatever it is. Right. But I want something to be more stylized than that. And I'm actually thinking that the next picture I do, I might actually go there as well myself because it's about belief. You want people to believe the story. And because everybody nowadays, everybody's got an iPhone or a smartphone and everybody's a cinematographer now and everybody's shooting, but everybody's shooting in available light all the time. Mm -hmm. Most people don't stop and take a moment to light their uh, Instagram feeds, eating a pie or whatever the hell they're doing. There's something to be said about that. Just keep it simple and keep it, you know, looking re realistic as opposed to stylized. When you ask me what do I really like about the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre for me, that's the stylized look of it that I gave that I, that I tell the same story in such a, a look that has so much more style than, than the first time. Although the first time is very effective. Right. And you described the remake, I think one says that the tone of puke. That was Marcus said to me. Marcus said that to me. He goes, uh, when he first went to Texas, because I, you know, I, I, I lived in Texas for a long time, right? I mean, when Marcus went there, he goes, Daniel, he goes, I don't know about Texas. The sky's too fucking blue. The grass is too fucking green. Everything's too, everything's too nice. I go, <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, this movie, it should be the colors of puke. You know, it should be, it should be the orange, you know, the orange and the puke and the fucking, that, that disgusting green and the puke. I went, okay, well, let's see what we can do about it. And there's a, a there's a website at the ASC. It's called the Daily Soup. The soup is what we call the chemistry that you soup film in. It's, it's ways to, now we do it digitally. 
the same way you could change an image on your computer with Photoshop. We have all the same tricks that are available to the color grading a film. But in the early days, you only had photochemistry, light and chemistry to change things. You couldn't do anything digitally. A computer didn't, was used. You didn't use a computer for anything. So fortunately, I do have the internet at this time. I use it as a research tool. And there's um, skip bleach processing where in the process of making a film print, they treat it to a developer, washes the developer out. And then there's something which bleaches, removes the excess silver because uh, film is silver halide, silver particles that have been light sensitized that capture, that's the grains in the film is actually particles of silver that are light sensitive. And when you stimulate them, that makes the exposure. And then in the process of development, a lot goes away in the development process, but maybe the last 10 or 15% you take away within a bleach step. And somebody decided to skip the bleach. Let's see what happens if you skip the bleach. And what it does is it increases your contrast, makes your blacks chunkier. It desaturates the colors, right? Because we're going to finish in film too. We're not going digital on the finishing and the remake. The remake is finished photochemically in a lab. There's no computer involved in the remake, in the look of the remake. There are a couple, the computer's involved with a couple of visual effects shots, but the look of that film is something I did with light and the film and the chemistry that's used. So I shoot a bunch of tests. We like it. The desaturation is perfect. The contrast, we love it. The whites get a little bit poppier, which we like. We want them to be a little bit smeary and hotter. We don't want polite whites. We want, when it goes white, we want it to be a little bit rude, a little bit, you know, as almost buzzy. Mm-hmm. And the blacks, we want the blacks chunky. We want the blacks to be really, really, really black. We want nobody seeing anything in the blacks. We want the shadows to be dark. Mm-hmm. And I shoot a bunch of uh, stills with a still camera. I get them to load me motion picture film into a still canisters that I can put into my Nikon. I was shooting with at the time Nikons. And I shoot all my tests and stuff different films, different situations on a still camera because it's fast. I don't have to have a whole crew. I don't have to have tripods. I can just sit there, put the camera wherever I want, wherever I want and get the shot quick. I don't have to rely upon anybody because I want to get the information quickly, right? So I strip it down as simple as I can. Also easier for me on a film, you're basically projecting it to look at it. And here I could shoot, you know, the the horizontal, the eight per, instead of four perfs high, which is what motion picture film is, same 35 millimeter film is and the still is eight perfs wide. So the image is more than tw- is twice as big. So wow. it's a lot easier to see how things react in a, in a test situation. Mm-hmm. We got the test back. It looked great. Fantastic. This is exactly what we want. Okay. We like it. We want to do it. Everybody, uh, even Bay got on the phone in the end going, guys, please don't do this to the film. Because if something about you're not bleaching it, you do it to the film, it's baked in, and we can't undo it. It's, but once you do it, it's done. We can't mm-hmm. like redevelop it and clear the bleach, clear, clear the silver. But they says, we will do, I think we're doing 3,000 screens, 3,200 screens. He goes, the most important 300 screens, we will do this process to the print. From New York, Los Angeles, the major cities, that they would do a, a skip bleach uh, pass on the prints that were going out to the theaters, mm-hmm. and we got our, we got our look. Yeah, and we timed the film originally at uh, Technicolor, and then for some crazy reason, we t- we timed the film on Kodak film. Got looking exactly where we want. We loved it. Just three pass, three three passes before we honed it on the look. We go great. That's it. Now make the make the prints. They go. Oh wait, you got to go to a different lab and onto Fuji film because that's how the distributor is going to release on a Fuji film and use this other lab. And a woman named Beverly Woods, who's an incredible woman. She's no longer, I don't think she's working in the film business, but she was our liaison and incredibly mm-hmm. very quickly was able to get us the exact same look for the entire 95 minutes of the film. When we switched labs and switched film, which I thought this is totally fucked up. This is going to be never be right because as a filmmaker, when you like something, you fall in love with that and nothing else will do. I'm going, it's never going to be the fucking same. And we're not going to like it because we love this. And so mm-hmm. anyhow, she managed to pull it off. You probably don't care about that part much. No, you know? that's really amazing. That's an accomplishment. Somebody, a fan, asked about the opening shot of the Chainsaw Massacre one with the cadaver on the... Yes, I actually didn't. I actually did not make that shot. Right? Yeah. 
There, there's a still photograph. Have you ever seen a still of that? There's a still photograph if you search it. It looks, uh, Lou Perry, excuse me, Ron Perryman. Right. Lou Perryman, it, later on, become an actor. Well known, unfortunately, was murdered in his front yard by a person who had mental issues. But um, not, I don't think they even knew him. They just went crazy and, and killed him, we think. But um, his, his older brother, Ron Perryman, was also a cinematographer. He was a, a, quite a genius, and he built a crane out of wood. It looks quite like a catapult. Um, mm. We joke about that a crane really is a catapult. A catapult, you pull something down, and you, go, you know. But a crane is you, know, you use counterweight instead of instead of pulling it down and letting it go. A spring deal, you use counterweight. So whatever weight you put mm. on one end of the crane, you put the same weight on the other end of the crane. Right. Actually, shorter on the bucket end. So you put three. If it's three times as long, you got to put three times as much weight in the back end. So yeah. he he built this wooden crane, and since it was his baby, his invention, he made the shot. So I was not around for that. But uh, it's, it's a brilliant shot. Related to that, someone else asked about Lou Perryman. They wanted to know why he left uh, the shoot. He didn't really see himself as an assistant cameraman. And uh, I don't know. He got, mad at, he, got, he got mad at me. I don't know. It's something he didn't like the way. I don't know. He got mad at me at one point and he quit on me. Um, it's not what he wanted to be doing. You know, he didn't. He didn't dig my act. Look, you know, I'm under a lot of pressure. I may not have been, you know, the most polite guy. Uh, I'm still, I don't have a reputation of being the kindest guy in the world because I care ultimately and really care about the film. Filmmaking is tough, right? And you're trying to make something great. And so you just want in every way to have the best shot you can at it. For the director, for the cinematographer, two of us are judged every single day. Every day on a film, there's a report that goes back to the studio, and they want to know how many minutes between when the crew got there till the camera rolled for the first time. And the next thing they want to know, it's at the top of the report, how many pages did they shoot, what were you supposed to shoot that day, and how much did you shoot that day, and did you get everything that you were supposed to shoot that day. And if that hasn't happened a couple of times in a row, heads roll. You know, everybody wants to go... Oh, it's a bit of a party. It's not a party at all. It's very much a job. Somebody sent me an email recently that when a film shows in the theaters, most people in the theater are not there seeing it for the first time. Most people, are, maybe it's the first time you're seeing it in a theater, but it's not mm-hmm. the first time they've seen the film. And I'm told that when that shot comes, the swing shot comes up and the camera cuts around back and starts to glide onto the swing, that the audience just breaks out in applause at that point. It's funny, it's an interesting story. Nispel, long before he was hired, to shoot um, the remake. We were doing commercials together. And he comes into work one day. He goes, Daniel, have you seen a new premiere magazine? And I go, no. I goes, he goes, they reckon you invented the dolly. I go, what? He goes, don't ask any more questions. He yells for a pr- production assistant. Come over here, give him $10. He goes, go buy two copies of premiere magazine. Come back. I start reading it. In this premiere magazine, it goes, well, the dolly shot was invented by F.W. Murnau, a great expressionistic director was put to great use by Alfred Hitchcock and furthered by Jean-Luc Godard. But perhaps the most pertinent dolly shot of all times is Daniel Pearl's shot in the Texas Chainsaw, the swing shot in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I read, I started, I literally, tears came to mind. I started crying. I went, what the fuck? I'm in a fucking paragraph with Murnau, Hitchcock and Godard. Question you guys have not asked, which I appreciate because people ask it all the time. I always go, what's a, what's a crazy question? But people go, mm-hmm. well, did you guys realize when you were making it that you were making you know, the horror classic of all times? And mm-hmm. I go, no. We, we Anybody who walk around, in fact, you know, I'm a believer in karma and filmmaking, right? If you're walking around going, yeah, we're Mr. Big Balls. This is going to be the greatest thing ever. Probably it's the worst thing you ever did, right? When you're nervous and, and you know, you're working hard, you don't know, and you're looking over your shoulder, is this going to be any good? Am I going to get fired? Are we going fast enough? You know, this creates an energy that you do, you work, work, work. And to answer the question, no, we did not walk around professing that this was going to be the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and people are going to be talking about it 48 years later. Did you have moments ever where, like, you're behind the camera, like, thinking, well, like, what the hell am I watching? This is amazing. Well, Maybe I didn't finish telling the story. And I, excuse me right. if I didn't. That scene where, where we first he picks up the chainsaw and starts it. And we mm-hmm. hear the chainsaw for the first time. And he's cutting. As I'm watching that, that's why I started talking to you about the video. I got distracted. Mm-hmm. And I started talking about that. I was the only person seeing that image. 
I'm sitting there going like, holy fuck. That's when I realized that we were doing something that was special. I did not tell myself we're going to be talking about this forever, but I thought this is some scary shit right here. And all of a sudden I hear a child screaming behind me and it's Ted Nicolau and his wife, Sally's daughter, who's about six or seven years old at the time, who's come with her to drop off the food and what happens to walk by and stop in a doorway that she can see this going on. And she just starts screaming. Of course, we cut the camera and we were concerned about what we had done to this child to expose her to this. But that was, that was the indication for me that this had a chance to be a something. There's only a handful of films that have this kind of a following and, and I'm forever indebted to that. I mean, you know. Everything, most of the, the scares in their work and, and they're earned and there's a context of reality, whether it's the insanity in the family or the Vietnam War. There's even like a voiceover radio caster in the beginning saying mm-hmm. horrific shit, just yeah. real world everyday stuff. What I, what I think works in the film, what makes the film so visceral is the fact that this shit could happen. If people are crazy, all it took is the right bunch of crazies. There are people that were not far off of that crazy in Texas at that time, may still be. That's why, in my mind, why the film works. Other than Pam, the character Pam coming back to life for a second after she pops out of the refrigerator. But, you know, really, you don't ever really see, you don't really see him kill her. So that's, I guess that was the thing. We did not ask you to suspend disbelief. You guys are too young, but it's a fucking snuff film. It's a fucking documentary, people thought. Toby is a genius. There were times when we thought he was silly as a fool. I'll be honest. You know, we were, we were young. You know, we had good, we had, obviously we had great ideas. All of us did. 23. A lot of people I brought in were 24, some 22. Toby's five years older than us. So he's 28, 29. Basically nobody's even in their thirties yet. In Hollywood, you couldn't even be a cinematographer till you're 50. Normally, if you were shit hot, you got to do it in your forties. We were, we were definitely short on experience. But I say long on ideas. Yeah, it's bursting with ideas and every moment, every element of the cast and the crew really like comes, you know, full form. Yeah. I, I'd like to mention something to you about the end scene. Go ahead. Uh, that pretty good little story. Uh, you know, we shot, you may have seen a photograph. It's a, it's a photograph that's actually around a lot of places. It's the one that I saw at the, in the, inside the Academy building, the Mary Pickford building that belongs to the, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. It's Sally, Marilyn Burns, about to jump into the pickup truck that she escapes in. Leatherface is lumbering back towards her to try to take one last swipe at her with the chainsaw. And, right, and that's just shooting the scene. So in that photograph, I'm handheld on the right. Wayne Bell is right next to me, blocking the lower part of my face with the microphone. On the left side of that frame is uh, Ron Perryman, He's shooting handheld on his knees. I'm standing. And as the scene progresses, she drives away. We're meant to stop because the pickup truck drives away. And what happens is, is Gunnar starts flailing. It's not rehearsed. We don't know what's going to happen. But Gunnar just starts this, he's he's enraged flailing. And I just start to do a dance with him. I'm on a wide angle lens. Judge distance by how big something is, right? Well, a wide angle lens by, it makes things smaller in your view, so you see more. Mm-hmm. So I'm under the impression that I'm further away from him than I am. I'm moving with the camera, and it's, that's one take. There's an edit, internal edits in it that jump cut it a little bit, but it's one continuous take of film. And they wouldn't let us do it again because they were all convinced when they call a cut that he had hit me in the head with, with the chainsaw. Even he was concerned that he might have hit me because... He's wearing a mask and he can't see me. So he and I talked about this thing a lot. That shot was just him carrying on and me not quitting and just getting in there, just keep shooting and keep shooting until they yell cut. Quite an important part of the film. It just says his frustration, the frustration of the killer, the, the prey got away, the hunter. The hunter lost the prey. You know? Yeah. Do you ever realize how bizarre it is? Because it, it doesn't really hit you unless you like digest it. But one of the most notorious like horror movie icon killers, villains, is basically just like uh, an out-of-place, mentally retarded person, somewhat victimized by his family. And he's just like, it's the most absurd thing in the world. But it's so, like you said, it has the element of reality backing it. Like, it could be anyone, you know. It mm-hmm. could, you know. Yeah, no, it's, well, you get the right crazies. And, you know, it could happen. You guys know, are familiar with my Instagram page? 
No. It's, it's D Pearl DP. Or you just you can go Daniel D- Pearl. But if you look down through the chainsaw, there's a reoccurring theme in there throughout from the, from the beginning. And to conclude, I just want to let you know that there's uh, somebody, he didn't have a question. He just wanted to let you know that him and many others regard you as one of the greatest cinematographers of all time. And he ranks you up there with like, I don't know the, the great ones, but like right up there. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm the last thing, a lot of people there that, that consider me to be that guy. And, you know, we didn't get into it much, but what I really am is, and everybody will say this, is that um, music video might have evolved in a very different way and a very different thing if it wasn't for Daniel Pearl. When music video started, I was the only person that ever made a movie. I just happened to be a guy who could deal with these budgets, deal with those situations, shoot quick, get the job done. And it's a very unorthodox style of shooting. I hoped, I'm not sure it'll happen for me anymore, but at, at about five, six years ago, I started doing features again because I wanted to kill it again. I wanted one more. But again, I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that you bring in to a sort of a renegade crazy situation where you'll be making up some of it as you go. You don't have enough money. You're going to need tricks to make it work. You're going to have to have good ideas. You're not going to be able to, to, to spend the money the proper way. You're not going to have 50 days to shoot it. You know, I'm that guy. That person is very pivotal to where my music videos became. Otherwise, they just would have been slow, boring films that the guys who made commercials would have shot or the guys who'd shot TV shows would have shot. But instead, Russell Mulcahy, who very much was the guy, he was the Steven Spielberg of music videos when MTV opened up. He was shooting in Los Angeles, got pissed off about what was going on, stormed out of the, out of the studio, as he was walking out, turned back to the room and said, if you fuckers want me to come back and work again, you better get me the guy who shot the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Didn't that like catapult you? It, it absolutely did. Yeah. It absolutely did. I had hit a home run in a horror film. Everybody was talking about my film, about Texas Chainsaw Massacre on television. Sit down in a restaurant. People are talking about all around you. This is a drug. Like there is no, there's no sweeter drug than this, man. To have everybody telling you, get an attaboy. You know, everybody goes, you killed that, man. Nobody could have done it. That's so great. It's fucking amazing. You know, it's beyond even our imagination. That is the thing that keeps me go back at it. I'm 71 years old. I was shooting last fucking weekend in Miami. I don't have to work anymore. I'm way past the point of needing to work. But I need that fix. I need to be told that I killed it. That's what keeps me alive. So it keeps me young. People can't believe me. You're not 70. When you're 54 years old, I go, all right, well, yeah, I was minus 16 when I shot the Texas Chainsaw Master. I mean, it was crazy, but, um, but, uh, you know, but, but it's that, that, that thing that keeps it, keeps it going. And music video did that again for me, you know, shooting Billy Jean. I mean, fuck the whole world. I mean, everybody was crazy for Billy Jean. It's like every artist that hears that uh, shot, shot Billy Jean. You know, they, they, they may be introduced to me and then they're walking away, you know, at the beginning of a video and somebody will say, I want to shake your hand again. And we already shook hand. Yeah, but now I know you shot Billie Jean. I, now it's for real, you know. <laughs> a lot of landmarks, police, every breath you take. I mean, a lot of techniques. We invented a lot. You know, people say there were rules and you guys like in music video, you guys, you guys broke the rules. right? Said, no, we didn't break them. We blew them the fuck up. Because they always wanted us to do something new and fresh, something that's never been done before. The biggest thing in music video was, let's do something that's never been done before. And a lot of it was by, okay, what's the rule here? Okay, the rule is in this situation, you do this, fuck that. That's just, I was just that guy. Anyhow. All right, guys. Take yeah. it easy. Like I said, I keep going. Everything just keeps like planting, you know, it's like a root. Of different things keep shooting off shoots, keep coming off of it. Mm-hmm. I try to talk about things. There's so many. So many <laughs> little Definitely leaves. write the book. I look forward to reading it. The book? The book, yeah. will probably, because I used to shoot one of his film. I, I had, a, I had a, a manual with a very expensive lens, a Rotenstock lens, on a manual Polaroid. So I would shoot Polaroids of my lighting setups. Now you can just see it, see how you like it. I would shoot a Polaroid, and I have boxes of these Polaroids. So the book will be probably more about music video than, than anything else. And it'll be photographs that I've taken and then a frame from the video that's relative to that and the stories from, from the videos. But there's hardly anybody, a little bit before you guys' time, but hardly anybody that I haven't shot. You know, not so much nowadays, but in the old days, I mean, you know, I shot everybody. All right. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.